Well, look, um, I'm going to be starting a series. I don't know if it's going to be two times, three times, or whatever the case. I don't really know how long. It's definitely going to be tonight, and I plan on uh, hitting this concept again next, uh, next week. You know, whenever we first started the church, I really was, like, crying out that the Lord would do something through this church and that God would, you know, God would bring deliverance and freedom and life to people's hearts and that, and that he would, he would you know, really do a work. And I do know that I've been in the church long enough to know the importance of both the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit, but also the importance of the Word of God. And so that's, and when I was praying, even however long it was, I don't even know how long we've had the church now, I just forget. It's not that it's not important, I'm just not good about those kinds of things. I think it's six, seven years, something like that. Maybe it'll be seven years. Almost eight, okay. So almost eight years. And, um, and, and you know, anyway, at the, at the time, like, just really crying out, and I just want to say that that the, that the word of God and that the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit is so important and that, and that God wants both to be working in unison in order for him to move. Now, as I begin to see, in my opinion, the landscape, as, I'm, as I feel like I'm led by the Holy Spirit, I feel like the times are, the times are bad. I, feel, I mean, I don't think it takes a genius. I don't even think you have to have a gift of discernment to be able to figure that the times are bad, that the world is in flux, that, that it's, it's bad out there, and that, and that we blind ourselves to it. I don't know about you, but, and I'm not trying to bring negativity. I'm just trying to speak the truth, that, that when we see what's going on, I think that many times the way that this has been progressing is that it's been very slow and methodical to the point where we wake up and we're like, how did we end up where we are in this current current state of things, right? And I do know that in the end, when it's all said and done, there's going to be a great harvest of God. Amen? The Word of God is very clear that there's going to be a great harvest. And so that's really what I want to talk to you about, at least over the next two times, because I really feel like God wants to do something. Now, when I say God wants to do something, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that we're going to have lines out into the street waiting to get in here. That's not what I'm here to tell you. What I'm here to tell you, though, is that God wants to do something. God wants to do something in you. He wants to do something in me. And he wants to, for us to take that thing that he wants to do, and he wants us to bring it to people that are hurting and people that are dying and that people that are in darkness and people that need hope in life. Amen. He wants that resurrection power that is spoken of, amen, in that song that we were talking about earlier to enter into our hearts and in our lives. Amen. And, and listen, when you think about the resurrection power of God, you can only think about the Holy Spirit and the importance of because it let the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead also dwell in your mortal body. Amen. And that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will also quicken your mortal body. He will bring life to you. Amen. Resurrection power. And so what I want to talk to you about, I'm, I have a specific concept. And, but this is the title of my little series, The Former Reigns and the Latter Reigns. And I'm going to tell you, it's very closely centered upon Pentecost, and it's very closely centered upon the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit. But more specifically, what I want you to understand is it's going to be a little bit of a history lesson, but along the way, um, I think that you're going to be blessed by it. Um, Aaron, could you do me a favor? Could you and Brandon grab those uh, pieces of paper off that, that stack of paper and kind of like hand them out? we got 20 of them, so if you see a couple, let them just have one. And uh, and or if people are sitting next to each other, y'all can just maybe have one, and then that way we make sure we have enough of them. How's that sound? So these are the lyrics to a song. I don't want you to spend a lot of time reading it before we get to the song. I'm going to play the song for you, and I want you to have the lyrics in your hand so that you can get a little bit more out of it whenever the, you see what I'm saying, that you'll be able to see. All right, so what I want to talk to you about whenever we're describing the former and the latter reigns has to do with really what has taken place the last 230 years in the church. You may not know a whole lot about what has happened in the last 230 years and why it's 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 
it, it, look, God just keeps reloading. There's other witnesses that have come afterwards, and there's been witnesses that have taken place in the last couple of hundred years. And I want to try to communicate to you that God is up to something. I believe God is up to something. I'm not just, I'm just not recycling some message from another preacher somewhere. I believe that God has been wanting to show up in our hearts and lives, in his people's hearts and lives, and that he's up to something, amen, and that he wants to bring in the harvest. And so when we talk about former rains and latter rains, I need you to understand that was a big part of Israel. I don't want to get ahead of myself. That was a big part of Israel's daily life. Okay, because, see, you and I, we have irrigation systems now, but they didn't have that then. And there was, they were an agrarian culture. They, they had animals, but they had harvest. They had to sow seed, okay? And I'm going to get into it a little bit more, but let it suffice to say at this moment in time that Israel was dependent on the former and the latter rains. The former rains would come about now around October time, and it would begin to soften the soil in preparation for the seed. And then the latter rains would come in the springtime in preparation for the great harvest. Okay, And so former and latter rains is specifically related to Israel's agricultural society and also interconnected to their worship. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But I'm also using this title to say, listen, it's got double meaning here. Because most Pentecostal people, you may not understand that, but this is a Pentecostal church. And most Pentecostal people, that, at least the people that write books about it, have have coined the term the former and the latter rains, meaning that former rains took place at Pentecost and that we had a latter rain movement that has already taken place in the history of the church. And that's kind of what I'm really hoping to talk to you about over the next couple of weeks, okay? So we're going to be talking specifically about the latter rains. Whenever we talk about these things, the, the focal point is on Pentecost. And you can see I put the flames of fire on the side because Pentecost, at least the day of Pentecost, was when, was when those divided tongues of fire descended and laid upon the heads and that the people began to speak in other tongues. So before we get into this message real good, I want to talk to you a little bit about an interconnection of some things that I'm starting to see. The Lord has really had on my heart about the Tower of Babel for quite some time, but I'm really starting to feel like I'm understanding it. Now, why would you talk about the Tower of Babel interconnected with the day of Pentecost? I'm going to tell you why. At the Tower of Babel, guess what there was? There was a diversity of tongues. There was a diversity of tongues because the Bible teaches us that at that point in time, all of the world was of one language. And what did they choose to do? Instead of listening in obedience to God and, and spreading over the face of the earth, because we learn in the book of Revelation that it's God's plan that he, they said it. And when they're singing in heaven, they're, they're giving glory to the Lamb, and they're saying, you redeemed us. With your blood, you redeem the souls of men with your blood from every tongue, tribe, and nation. After the flood, God told the people groups to replenish the earth. But what did they do? In rebellion under the leadership of Nimrod, a type of the Antichrist, they instead went and they said, let us build ourselves a city. Let us build ourselves a tower. Let us make bricks. Let us make a name for ourselves. They built a society that excluded God from it. Listen, the world that you and I live in today is a society that does not want God a part of of what it's doing. Even before the Tower of Babel, Cain was building his own society. And his first act was to kill his brother and to spill the righteous blood of Abel on the ground. And the Lord said that the righteous blood of Abel cries out from the ground. And from that day moving forward, there's been two types of altars. There's people that say that they want to live for God, but they want to live for God their own way. And then there's the people of God that understand God has one way, and it has to go through the sacrifice of an innocent lamb. Hallelujah. And it's important for us to understand that. Because part of what I'm going to be talking about over the next couple of services is, look, we want fire. And listen, sometimes when you have fire, sometimes things get a little wild. But we don't want to be confused and, and, get, and something shows up that it ain't supposed to be. That's all I'm trying to say. Now, at the same time, I'm just going to let you know, the Lord's already gotten a hold of me, at least to some extent. He said, slow your roll, son. Don't be quenching my spirit and let my spirit flow. Amen? So 
Tower of Babel, diversity of tongues. Why? Because they rebelled. There was a rebellion. And their rebellion drove them away from the presence of God. I want you to see that. God pronounced judgment. See, listen, when he divided the tongues, it was a form of judgment. And it made them separate into the people groups. That's whenever nations became nations. It began to spread. You understand? They became like little nomadic tribes. And wherever they walked and they settled, that's what, what, what those little people groups still had in common was their language. So out of judgment, because of their disobedience, obedience, God confused their languages and there was a diversity of tongues. Rebellion drove them away. Who? The nations. Now, we've been doing some studying on our off night. One of the major things that I've gotten out of that book, there's a whole lot of stuff that I didn't agree with, a lot of stuff that I did agree with, but one major thing that I've gotten is the concept of of God bringing the nations back to himself. Again, I told you, I'm driving down the road, and the Lord said, Matt, you don't have to keep apologizing when you talk to people about me, whether you're talking in public or wherever you are. This world belongs to me. I created it. It's mine. They're trying to steal it, and I'm taking it back. Hallelujah. And the kingdom of God, hallelujah, the kingdom of God and God sending his son and all of the, the psalms in the Old Testament that are talking about the nation's rage against God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things shall be added unto you. And again, Revelation chapter 5, for you have redeemed us from every tongue and tribe and nation. God is bringing the nations back. He's taking back what belongs to him. Hallelujah. And he's given you and I the opportunity to partner with him. Oh, man, that sounds boring, dude. I want to just live my life the way I, you know, you just go right ahead, my friend. You, you don't want to be part of what God's doing, because listen to me. James said it, and how many times do I have to preach it, that our life is a temporary vapor. It's going to be here one day, and it's going to be gone the next. All your riches, come on, King Tut, you're not going to bring your riches with you to the other side. Hallelujah. You're not bringing material possessions, which you can't bring. You can bring, by the grace of God, all those that you bring with you, whoever they may be. Hallelujah. All right. So rebellion drove them away, and there was a diversity of tongues. The beautiful thing, and I've said it many times, is if you turn the page from the Tower of Babel, what happens? Y'all know the story. I've said it multiple times. God calls a man named Abraham. What did he do with Abraham? He created a people and a tongue for himself. What you talking about, preacher? Out of Abraham came the nation of Israel. They spoke a specific language, the Hebrew language. They were representatives of him. He gave them his word. Really and truly, the language they spoke was the word of God. He gave them the law. He showed them his character, and he said, let your light shine. Oh, he didn't say that to the old town. Yeah, he did. He said, when I bring you through into Canaan, and those people there see you, they will say, what other people has there ever been such as this that has the word of their God so near them? And now Jesus would say in the New Testament, let your light shine before men, that they might see your works and glorify your God in heaven. So God created a people that ultimately became Israel. But what did Israel do? They rebelled. They rebelled against God. Listen, I'm not over here to judge Israel because the Lord knows I've rebelled against God. Have you not rebelled against God? Come on, don't come up in here acting all super spiritual and full of religion because we ain't got time for that. That smells like that possum that fell out my roof today. Okay, it stinks. Okay, the spirit of religion stinks. But look, not only did Israel rebel against God, look, they did the big one. See that? You saw how rebellion grew? They did the big one. What are you talking about? They hung the king of the universe on a cross. They crucified the king of glory. They did the big rebellion against God. They, he, God sent his only son to them, for them, and they rejected him. And their rejection of him gives you and I the opportunity to receive. God's got a beautiful plan, amen. So when we're talking about Pentecost, again, there's a lot to be said. Because, see, at Pentecost, there was diversity of tongues, right? And what is happening at Pentecost is that he draws them back. Who? 
the nations. If you read the story in the book of Acts, this is not accidental, my friend. This is very important. This is a theme in scripture. What is the purpose of Pentecost? It's not just so that people can hear us speaking in other tongues. I've seen Christians say, listen, man, I got saved when I was 19. I'm 55. I'm getting old. I've seen Christians that say that they speak in other tongues. I've been the same way. Ain't told nobody about Jesus in a month of Sundays. The purpose of Pentecost is power. Power from on high to be witnesses for the Lord so that the fire of God would fall in our hearts and in our lives and that we would be witnesses and that when we begin to speak the truths of God, it would begin to burn in their hearts. They'd feel the presence of God burning in their hearts. Hallelujah. No, that's good. If you've ever spoke, listen, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it happened recently. Well, it probably did. I can't remember exactly when, but somebody I just prayed with or talked to, I can't, I can't remember how many days ago, tears were filling up in their eyes. I can remember a time whenever I, when the Lord first getting a hold of me, and I'm sitting there talking to them about Jesus, and tears just start streaming. Now, and I'm not talking about in a church. I'm talking about at the pediatric clinic. The tears just start streaming. Now I got to pray that prayer. Help me pray that prayer. That's what I want. Hallelujah. That's what I want you to have. That's what we should be wanting together, a move of God where the fire of Pentecost burns. What are you talking about? Fire of God is not good. Yeah, fire of God is good. Jeremiah said that the word of the Lord is like a fire shut up in my bones and I grow weary when I try to hold it back. We want the fire of God to cause his word to consume. So listen, at Pentecost, if you'll remember, there was people from all different walks of life. They were coming to Jerusalem. Why? Because it was the day of Pentecost. I'm going to explain that to you a little bit, why everybody was in Jerusalem at that point in time. It was for a purpose because this was an ongoing feast that God had given to Israel when they left Egypt in the Exodus. God prepared them for this. It was part of the Passover concept. It was all running together. Pentecost was running together along with Passover. We'll talk about that real quick, but look. It's a diversity of tongues. It says, we hear them in our own language. And if you'll remember the story, it says there were people from Medes and Parthians and Jews and people from all over. And we hear them speak, hallelujah, the glorious works of God in our own language. So what's happening is he's drawing the nations back. What was originally a judgment on them, now he's saying, hallelujah, I'm bringing them back. God is doing a work. And so look, I want you to see, I want you to see the, the, the comparison. The Tower of Babel, diversity of tongues. Pentecost, diversity of tongues. Tower of Babel, rebellion drove them away. Pentecost, obedience, drawing them back. Whose obedience, you say? The obedience of the Lamb of God. The obedience of the Lamb of God to do the work of God, to die upon the cross, to pay the penalty for every sin and every man. And he had no sin. And so he resurrected from the dead. Hallelujah. And he said, it is expedient. It is a good thing that I go to the Father. For if I do not go, he will not come. But I pray to the Father that he send another comforter. Hallelujah. The one that's called alongside to help the comforter, the Holy Spirit. And there they are in the book of Acts. And the Holy Spirit descends. And guess what? The languages come forth. Now, as far as the languages go, let me just say this. I don't have all the answers to that. I will tell you this. The Apostle Paul says, though I speak in the tongues of men or angels. Okay, am I saying it's a tongue of an angel? I'm not saying that. But guess what? I don't know. And I'm going to tell you when I don't know. I do know this. I got to saw, and I've told you all this before, Stanley Horton. He was 93 years old. He is the, the one true back in the gap Pentecostal scholar. He wrote books on Pentecost. He was a Harvard graduate. I got to see this man when he was 93 years old. And you know what he said? And I don't remember the number exactly, but he said, we have lost, we have over 11,000 human languages that are currently alive and we have lost 3,000 or more. That means that there is at least 14,000 human languages that have been in existence on the earth and that 3,000 of them aren't even utilized anymore. 
so I 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 so But I don't know if they're actually speaking Spanish as much as the hearer is receiving the message that God wants to speak. So nevertheless, I don't, that's, that's above my pay grade, but I'll give you my opinion on it. So the diversity of tongues, God's drawing them back. All right? So let's just look a little bit more like at Pentecost. And again, I want to make the point that before Pentecost was ever a day, it was a feast. Before Pentecost was ever a day, it was a feast. Now, this is the kind of stuff that I like. I won't stay here too long for you guys, but I want you to be able to see the connections, okay? Because in Leviticus 23, and I've been trying to talk to y'all about this for about 10 years now. And I don't know, I put, I've seen y'all go to sleep on me, and it's okay. But, but, but look, this is the reason why I've been trying to talk to you about it for 10 years, because it's important. In Leviticus chapter 23, God begins to explain to Israel about the feasts and the fact that he wants them to keep these feasts annually and to worship him and the place where he would tell them to go. And ultimately, Jerusalem was the place that he chose. The first feast was Passover. The second, and that started the whole week of unleavened bread. Paul tells us that Jesus is our Passover lamb. Unleavened is, uh, leaven is yeast, which is representative of sin. And guess what? The sinless one came to die in place of the sinful ones. Jesus fulfills those two right there. The Feast of First Fruits is the first Sunday after the Passover. Jesus resurrected on the first Sunday after the Passover. Do what you want with that, dude. It just don't get no better than that, my friend. Fifty days after the Feast of First Fruits, what happens? The Feast of Pentecost takes place. And here we have now the concept of the former reigns and the latter reigns because look, and, and we're talking about the latter reign movement, but I want you to see something. When we talk about the day of Pentecost, you got to understand the Passover in the Old Testament, Jesus died on the Passover. Do you get that? Jesus died on the Passover and Jesus resurrected from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits, and 50 days later, cloven tongues of fire fell in the upper room, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, and the power of God became manifest in the lives of the disciples to the point where they brought Jesus with them everywhere that they went. They were so convinced about the power of the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, that they were willing to give their lives for the kingdom of God. All you got to do is recant your story. Just say that you didn't see the resurrected Christ. No, I'd rather be drugged behind a chariot through the streets of Egypt than to recount, recant and deny that Jesus, that I saw him in the flesh, that I saw him resurrected, that I walked with him, that I talked with him. Thomas said, no, run me through with that Indian spear because I stuck my finger in his hand. I thrust my hand in his side, or at least he offered me to. I saw it right there with my eyes. I will not change my story. And that is the power of Pentecost, my friend. Hallelujah. And look, that's what I want you to see. That's the former reign, the day of Pentecost, the former reign. Okay, and guess what? The Azusa Street Revival. We're going to be talking about Azusa Street, 1906, uh, uh, Southern California. The Holy Spirit moved and went worldwide. And you and I now believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. But let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. There was a silence period where people in, in large groups were not baptized that way. They were not speaking in other tongues. There is documentation that shows that there were sporadic instances where people got filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in other tongues. But when Azusa Street hit, it spread like wildfire. The former rains taking place in the month of maybe October, preparing the soil. Come on, somebody. Because see, it's not just about a literal feast for Israel. The whole Bible is full of harvest. 
full of harvest, full of the sowing of seed. And so just as in Old Testament Israel, then the Pentecostal day was the former rain that prepared the soil for the message, the seed of the living gospel to go forward and to be planted in the soil of this earth so the truth of the gospel could be preached so that people's lives could be changed. That's the former rains. That's the literal day of Pentecost. And now we're nearing the end, my friend. And about 100 years ago or so, a a latter-day rain came. And what was the purpose of the latter-day rain? To thicken the harvest, to get it full, to get it prepared (laughs) for the day that they would reap it. And as the days grow darker, as this world gets darker, God wants his light to shine brighter. And he wants people to be filled with the spirit of God, hallelujah, to do the work of God. And that's what we're going to be kind of focusing on as we move forward. Listen, there's been so many awesome moves of God, even probably over the last 300 years or so. But what I'm focusing on right now, because i got to start somewhere, is the last 230 years. Now, as we do that, I want to mention this, the Wesleyan holiness movement. You ever seen these, uh, this symbol before? Anybody ever seen that symbol? What is that, what is that symbol of? The Methodist Church. The Methodist Church. See, John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist Church. Oh, well, I know some Methodists, and they don't even love the Lord. But let me tell you something, my friend. It wasn't always that way. The Methodist, the Wesleyan holiness movement prepared the way for the Azusa Street Revival. I'm telling you right now, this is the truth that I'm trying to tell you. That John Wesley burned, I'm about to tell you the story of John Wesley. It's so powerful. Oh, man, it just touches my heart. But it prepared the way. I want you to understand, how did it prepare the way, preacher? I need to understand better. Okay, look, John Wesley. February 28, 1784, John Wesley plants his first church in America. But I need you to understand something. <clears throat> Before that, John Wesley had been to America. He was from Britain. He was English. He had, listen, he was, l- let, me, let me share this with you. You see this? Let me just tell you the story of John Wesley. You know what that is? That's a dining table. And what is my purpose of it? I'm explaining. Because I read a story one time about John Wesley, Charles Wesley. Listen, they, this, the mama had 19 children. The mama had 19 children. I think I just recently read nine of them made it. So they had 10 children in the house. And and uh, one story I read said that John Wesley's father would cause him and his brother Charles and the other children to learn Greek at the the dining room table. Okay, so that was part of what, what they were instructed to do was to try to learn the Greek language. Now, what is that word right there in Greek? That is where we get the word pyre which is the Greek word for fire, okay? And so P-Y-R-E is how we would spell it in English. That, so I just put that there because John Wesley's ministry is associated with fire, and I'll explain that to you a little bit more. Look, I used to tell Sierra about this. What is that supposed to be? That's John Wesley's mama right there. I've told you all the story. With all them children running around the house, this woman was consecrated to the Lord. This woman loved God, and the story goes that when you saw mama under the sheet, you didn't mess with her because she was spending time with the Lord. Now, this is the environment that John Wesley and Charles Wesley grew up in. I wish I could have mentioned Cynthia Wesley and the other two sisters that wrote the song that we used to sing at Crossing Place in Franklin. They wrote the lyrics to this song, lift up your head, O ye gates. Yes, that's a psalm, but they turned it into a song, and, and hallelujah, but I couldn't, I couldn't get that together. The point is, is that these children were consecrated to the work of God. All right, but John Wesley shows up in America and things don't go the first time like he plans. He goes back to, and this is his brother, uh, Charles Wesley. He wrote 6,500 hymns, and one of them is called And Can It Be, and that's the lyrics that you have on your piece of paper. Don't read it yet. I'm going to play an updated version of the song for you before we go today in this presentation, and I just want you to see the kind of lyrics they were singing during these times. And I want you to, uh, you're also going to experience a a message preached by John Wesley. You're going to have to dig in your heels, and you're going to have to bear with me because these people you know what they did? They, they wrote their sermons and they read them. But I don't want to just, I want to give, I want to tell you something first. John Wesley shows up to America the first time and he goes back home defeated. 
he had fallen in love with a woman in America, and he, and he was praying to God so much that he felt like God didn't want him to be married, and then the woman ended up marrying someone else, and he was heartbroken. And he goes back to England. And one day while he was in a class, he was being a student in a class, and they were teaching on Martin Luther's, they were reading Martin Luther's commentary. We're not talking about Martin Luther the king. We're talking about Martin Luther. Y'all know who I'm talking about? The Protestant reformer, the guy who was formerly a Catholic monk that saw what the Catholic church was doing to people, and he wrote up 95 theses, questions, and he went in Germany to the door of Wittenberg, Germany, on the church, pack, pack, and he nailed it to the door, and he said, I'm just looking for answers. And the Catholic Church said, you little menial monk, take your 95 theses. I'm not saying they said it like this, but this is kind of what it is. You can take your theses and go down the road because we ain't answering none of your questions because we're the Catholic Church. And so guess what happened? People said, no. He started preaching this right here, because this is the scripture that changed Martin Luther's life. He saw people having to pay for indulgences so that they could get prayers for the dead. He saw the people crawling up cement stairs and all of these kinds of things, trying to crawl on their knees. Oh, God, please, because they were bound by sin. He said, I was bound by sin. I was tormented by the enemy. He struck fear in my heart. He would come into my room at night. He would, he would torment me, and I had no power. And I would sit there, and I would cringe in my bed. And then one day he said, I, I'm talking about Martin Luther, I read Romans 1.17, and it said, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And when he read those words, listen to me, I'm talking to you about the power of the gospel tonight. Listen, the, there is power inherent in the gospel. It will reach in and it will change your heart, my heart, our lives. And when he read that, the words leapt off the page and that brother became born again. Amen. Hallelujah. He said the next time the devil came into his room, he said, oh, no, you don't, slew foot. <laughs> no, you don't. I got something living in me now that's greater than you. Listen, nobody knew this stuff then. The Catholic Church had hidden the word of God from the people, and it took a brave Catholic monk. Did he have everything right? No, he didn't. But guess what? No, neither do we. Amen? And the Lord changed him. So what about John Wesley? John Wesley, after this defeat, is back in England. He's sitting in a classroom setting, and they begin to read Luther's commentary on this verse. You know what Wesley said? As they read it, my heart was strangely warmed. Hmm. All this time he wasn't even saved. All this time he wasn't even born again. He was learning Greek at the dinner table. He would see his mama praying under a sheet. He had gone to America to try to be a preacher. And all this time he wasn't even saved. He was trying to do it in his own strength. And whenever this was read, he said, my heart was strangely warmed. And from there, that brother, you couldn't have stopped him to save your life. He was on horseback and he just rode all over America preaching the gospel. Amen. So I wanted to share with you real quick this song. And, and listen, this is an updated version. I'm going to be honest with you. It's an updated version. We'll talk more about this guy later, the guy that's singing this song. We'll talk more about this later. We're not going to talk about it tonight. But this is an updated version. And I use the lyrics that he uses in here. But I, want you, I wanted you to be able to hear so you can read the lyrics along with... Um,
All right. For the purposes of moving forward, I just wanted to. Did you catch that one lyric where he said, Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke and my dungeon flamed with light. <laughs> the beauty of the poetry that is being spoken there, but the message. You know what he's talking about? He's, he's saying, I was like in a dungeon. My spirit was in a dungeon. I was in the midst of darkness. I was chained in darkness. But your eye, your eye saw me the whole time. And when your eye brought that quickening ray, that's old King James language for talking about life, quickening life. Your eye brought a life ray into that place and it caused my dungeon. It caused my dungeon to flame with life and my chains fell off and my heart was free and I rose, went forth and I followed thee. Listen to me, church. That's what people need right there. People need the truth of the gospel to enter into their heart and to free them. Amen. Now here's another song. This was not written by Charles Wesley, but it was written by a man named William Booth, amen, a British Methodist preacher. Okay, he lived between 1829 and 1912, so about 100 years or so, 50 to 75 years after the Methodist church, after John Wesley, and he founded the Salvation Army. The text is based on the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. I'm trying to get you to understand the kind of music that was being played, the hymns that were being sung, the lyrics that they were singing during this time frame, and the hearts of the people. You got to understand what the this holiness movement was about. They were crying out to God, cleanse our hearts, Lord. Do a work on the inside of us. Make us holy like you. Amen. So I want you to, to see what this, uh, the words to this song right here. Same guy, by the way, singing this song.
praise God. We need another Pentecost. Amen. Send the fire today. Yeah, I thought the same thing. Now I could hear it. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Wesleyan holiness movement. You know, one of the things that I want you to know is that they were crying out. You know, one of the things that, that they came up with in this Wesleyan holiness movement, they considered the second work of grace something that they called entire sanctification. So when the Pentecostal move originally took place at Azusa Street, they were calling the baptism in the Holy Spirit the third work of grace. We understand now, but they were being touched by the Holy Ghost, and he was doing a work in their hearts, and they just wanted to live holy for the Lord. Amen? And, um, and so anyway, we understand that sanctification begins through faith in Christ, right, and that it's a progressive work that continues. And so they thought, they thought of it a little bit different, but the point that I want you to understand is that they were burning, they were desiring for God's holiness to burn in them. And that God, you, you saw the words, that was in 18, you know, somewhere in the 1800s, where he's saying, we need another Pentecost. We need to send the fire, Lord, just like you showed up for Elijah, send the fire. All right. So what I wanted to tell you as I begin to, I'm actually going to read one of John Wesley's messages to you. I know that probably sounds boring. But before I read it, I want you to know and it's kind of long. I'm not going to lie to you. But look, man, these people, look, they, they sat in church and they, and they listened to these messages. And I want you, because I want you to see not only the lyrics that they sang, but I also want you to see the kind of message that he preached, okay? And before I do it, and we think, oh, how boring for those poor people that he would just read his message. Well, one day, because the crowds were unbelievable, like he was preaching outdoors, and, and, he, they, he, and the crowds would just throng his ministry, talking about John Wesley. And one day a news reporter asked, sir, why are all these people showing up? And this was his response. I buy myself a field, I set myself on fire, and they come to watch me burn. So how in the world I'm going to read this man's message and do it with the passion that he must have done it with? Because he obviously wasn't just reading monotone. He was definitely reading with passion and fire in the midst of all of this. I don't know how we're going to pull it off, but we're going to try. Y'all ready? Here we go. I'm going to have to try to have the words on this message. This is the message that he wrote. And listen, the, lang the English is a little bit older. So sometimes it's a little bit harder maybe to understand because they wrote very eloquently and poetic. But I think you're going to get the point. You don't have to catch every single word, but you're going to get the point when it's all said and done of what, was, of what was going on. Let me see if I can't find where I put the words so that you could kind of follow along with me a little bit. Y'all ready? So here we go. The marks of the new birth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit, John 3, 8. How is everyone that is born of the Spirit, that is born again, born of God? What is meant by being born again? The being born again of God or being born of the Spirit, what is implied in the being a son or a child of God or having the spirit of adoption? That these privileges by the free mercy of God or ordinarily annexed to baptism. He was coming against baptism, by the way, because people were putting their faith in baptism and he was trying to take, to take them down a notch. He says, which is thence termed by our Lord in a preceding verse? The being born of water and of the spirit. We know, but, would, but we would know what these privileges are. What is the new birth? Perhaps it is not needful to give a definition of this, seeing the scripture gives none. But as the question is of the deepest concern to every child of man, since except a man be born again, born of the spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I propose to lay down the marks of it in the plainest manner, just as I find them laid down in scripture. One, the first of these, and the foundation of all the rest is faith. So St. Paul, ye are all the children of God by faith in in Christ Jesus. So St. John, to them gave he power, right or privilege, to it might rather be translated, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born when they believed, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, not by natural generation, nor of the will of man, like those children adopted by men, in whom no inward change is thereby wrought, but of God. And again in his general epistle, 
whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. But it is not a barely notional or speculative faith that is here spoken of by the apostles. It is not a bare assent or agreement to this proposition. Jesus is the Christ, nor indeed to all the propositions contained in our creed or in the Old and New Testament. It is not merely an assent or agreement to any or all these credible things as credible to say this were to say which who could hear that the devils were born of God. For they have this faith. They trembling believe both that Jesus is the Christ and that all scripture having been given by inspiration of God is true as God is true. It is not only an assent to divine truth upon the testimony of God or upon the evidence of miracles, for they, the demons, they also heard the words of his mouth and knew him to be a faithful and true witness. They, the demons, could not receive the testimony he gave could not but receive the testimony he gave, both of himself and of the Father which sent him. They saw likewise the mighty works which he did, and this believed that he came forth from God. Yet notwithstanding this faith, they are still reserved in chains of darkness unto the judgment of the great day. For all this is no more than a dead faith. The true living Christian faith, which whosoever has is born of God, is not only an assent, an act of understanding, but a disposition which God hath wrought in his heart, a sure trust and confidence in God that through the merits of Christ his sins are forgiven and he reconciled to the favor of God. This implies that a man first renounce himself that in order to be found in Christ, to be accepted through him, he totally rejects all confidence in the flesh that having nothing to pay, having no trust in his own works or righteousness of any kind, he comes to God as a lost, miserable, self-destroyed, self-condemned, undone, helpless sinner as one whose mouth is utterly stopped, who is altogether guilty before God. Such a sense of sin, commonly called despair by those who speak evil of the things they know not together with a full conviction such as no words can express that of Christ only comes our salvation and an earnest desire of that salvation must precede a living faith, a trust in him who for us paid our ransom by his death and fulfilled the law of his life. This faith then whereby we are born of God is not only a belief of all the articles of our faith, but also a true confidence of the mercy of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And a median and constant fruit of this faith, whereby we are born of God, a fruit which can in no wise be separated from it. No, not for an hour. Is power over sin, power over outward sin of every kind, over every evil word and work. For wheresoever the blood of Christ is thus applied, it purgeth the conscience from dead works and over inward sin. For it purifieth the heart from every unholy desire and temper. This fruit of faith St. Paul has largely described in the sixth chapter of his epistle to the Romans. How shall we saith he who by faith are dead to sin live any longer therein. Our old man is crucified with Christ that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin. Likewise reckon ye yourselves to be dead unto sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore for reign in your mortal body, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. For sin shall not have dominion over you. God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but being made free. The plain meaning is God be thanked that though you were in time past the servants of sin, yet now being free from sin, you are become the servants of righteousness. The same invaluable privilege of the sons of God is as strongly asserted by St. John, particularly with regard to, form, to the former branch of it, namely power over outward sin. After he had been crying out as one astonished at the depth of the riches of the goodness of God, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and doth not yet appear what we shall be. 
but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. He soon adds, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin, because he is born of God. But some men will say, true, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin habitually. Habitually? Whence is this that I read it not? It is not written in the book. God plainly saith, he doth not commit sin. And thou addest habitually? Who art thou that mendest the oracles of God, that addest to the words of this book? Beware, I beseech thee, lest God add to thee all the plagues that are written therein. Especially when the comment, thou addest, is such as quite swallows up the text, so that by this methodia plainest, that's Greek and Ephesians 2, talking about the cubia of men and the deceitful trickery of their hands. I preached to y'all on that before. Artful method of deceiving the precious promise is utterly lost by this cubia anthropon, the trickery of men, tricking and shuffling of men. The word of God is made of no effect. Oh, beware, thou that thus taketh from the words of this book, that taking away the whole meaning and spirit from them, leavest only what may indeed be termed a dead letter, lest God take away thy part out of the book of life. Suffer we the apostle to interpret his own words by the whole tenor of his discourse. In the fifth verse of this chapter, he said, ye know that he, Christ, was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. What is the inference he draws from this? Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. To his enforcement of this important doctrine, he premises and highly necessary caution. Little children, let no man deceive you, for many will endeavor so to do, to persuade you that you may be unrighteous, that you may commit sin, and yet be children of God. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. Then follows, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this adds the apostle, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. By this plain mark, the committing or not committing sin, are they distinguished from each other? To the same effect are those words in his fifth chapter. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one Toucheth him not. Another fruit of this living faith is peace. For being justified by, by faith, having all our sins blotted out, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, this indeed our Lord himself, the night before his death, solemnly bequeathed to all his followers peace. Peace, saith he, I leave with you, you who believe in God, and believe also in me. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, gives it, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And again, these things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. This is that peace of God which passes all understanding, that serenity of soul which it has not entered into the heart of a natural man to conceive and which it is not possible for even the spiritual man to utter. And it is a peace which all the powers of earth and hell are unable to take from him. Waves and storms beat upon it, but they shake it not. For it is founded upon a rock. It keeps the hearts and minds of the children of God at all times and in all places, whether they are in ease or in pain, in sickness or health, in abundance or want, they are happy in God. In every state they have learned to be content. Yea, to give thanks unto God through Christ Jesus, being well assured that whatsoever is, is best because it is his will concerning them. So that in all the vicissitudes of life, their heart stands fast, believing in the Lord. A second scriptural mark of those who are born of God is hope. 
Thus St. Peter, speaking to all the children of God who were then scattered abroad, saith, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. A lively or living hope, saith the apostle, because there is also a dead hope, as well as a dead faith. A hope which is not from God, but from the enemy of God and man, as evidently appears by its fruits. For as it is the offspring of pride, so it is the parent of every evil word and work. Whereas every man that has in him this living hope is holy, as he that calleth him is holy. Every man that can truly say to his brethren in Christ, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and we shall see him as he is, purifieth himself even as he is pure. This hope implies first the testimony of our own spirit or conscience, that we walk in simplicity and godly sincerity. Secondly, the testimony of the spirit of God bearing witness with or to our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Let us well observe what is here taught us by God himself, touching this glorious privilege of his children. Who is it that is here said to bear witness, not our spirit only, but another, even the spirit of God? He it is who beareth witness with our spirit. What is it he beareth witness of? That we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, if we deny ourselves, if we take up our cross daily, if we cheerfully endure persecution or reproach for his sake, that we may also be glorified together. And in whom doth the Spirit of God bear this witness? In all who are the children of God. By this very argument does the apostle prove in the preceding verses that they are so, as many, saith he, as are led by the Spirit of God. They are are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, it follows the spirit itself, beareth witness with our own spirit that we are the children of God. The variation of the phrase in the 15th verse is worthy our observation. You have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You as many as are the sons of God have in virtue of your sonship received that self-same spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We, the apostles, prophets, teachers, for so the word may not improperly be understood. We, through whom you have believed, the ministers of Christ and stewards of the, ministry, the mysteries of God, as we and you have one Lord, so we have one spirit. As we have one faith, so we have one hope also. We and you are sealed with one spirit of promise, the earnest of your and our inheritance, the same spirit bearing witness with your and with our spirit that we are the children of God. And thus is the scripture fulfilled. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. For it is easy to believe that though sorrow may precede this witness of God's spirit with our spirit, indeed must in some degree, while we groan under fear and a sense of the wrath of God abiding on us, yet as soon as any man feeleth it in himself, his sorrow is turned into joy. Whatsoever his pain may have been before, yet as soon as that hour has come, he remembered the anguish no more. For joy that he is born of God. It may be many of you have now sorrow because you are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, because you are conscious to yourselves that you have not this spirit, that you are without hope, without God in the world. But when the comforter has come, then your heart shall rejoice. Yea, your joy shall be full, and that joy no man takes from you. We joy in God. Will you say through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now? Now receive the atonement by whom we have access into this grace, this state of grace, of favor or reconciliation with God, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You saith St. Peter, whom God hath begotten again unto a lively hope, are kept by the power of God into salvation, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith 
faith may be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, in whom, though now you see him, not ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, unspeakable indeed. It is not for the tongue of man to describe this joy in the Holy Ghost. It is the hidden manna which no man knows save he that receives it. But this we know, it not only remains but overflows in the depth of affliction. Are the consolations of God small with his children when all earthly comforts fail? Not so, but when sufferings most abound, the consolation of his spirit do much more abound, in so much that the sons of God laugh at destruction when it comes, at want, pain, hell, the grave, as knowing him who has the keys of death and hell, and will shortly cast them into the bottomless pit, as hearing even now the great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. A third scriptural mark of those who are born of God and the greatest of all is love. Even the love of God shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto them, because they are sons of God. Because they are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son in their hearts, crying, Abba, Father, by this spirit continually looking up to God as their reconciled and loving father, they cry to him for their daily bread. For all things needful, whether for their souls or bodies, they continually pour out their hearts before him, knowing they have the, petent, the petitions which they ask of him. Their delight is in him. He is the joy of their heart, their shield, their exceeding great reward. The desire of their soul is toward him. It is their meat and drink to do his will. They are satisfied as with marrow and fatness, while their mouth praiseth him with joyful lips. And in this sense also, everyone who loveth him that begat loveth him that is begotten of him. His spirit rejoiceth in God his Savior. He loveth the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. He is so joyful Joined unto the Lord as to be one spirit. His soul hangeth upon him and chooseth him as altogether lovely, the chiefest among 10,000. He knoweth, he feeleth what that means. My beloved is mine and I am his. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Full of grace are thy lips because God hath anointed thee forever. The necessary fruit of this love of God is the love of our neighbor, of every soul which God hath made, not expecting our enemies, not, not, ex, not accepting our enemies, not accepting those who are now despitefully using and persecuting us, a love whereby we love every man as ourselves, as we love our own souls. Nay, our Lord has expressed it still more strongly, teaching us to love one another even as he has loved us accordingly the commandment written in the hearts of all those that love God is no other than this. As I have loved you, so love ye one another. Now herein perceive we the love of God and that he laid down his life for us. We ought then, as the apostle justly infers, to lay down our lives for the brethren. If we feel ourselves ready to do this, then do we truly love our neighbor. Then we know that we have passed from death unto life, because we thus love the brethren. Hereby know we that we are born of God, that we dwell in him and he in us, because he has given us of his loving spirit. For love is of God, and everyone that thus loveth is born of God and knoweth God. But some may possibly ask, does not the apostle say, 
This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Yay. And this is the love of our neighbor also in the same sense as it is the love of God. But what would you infer from hence that the keeping the outward commandments is all that is implied in loving God with all your heart, with all your mind and soul and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself, that the love of God is not an affection of the soul, but merely an outward service, that the love of our neighbor is not a disposition of heart, but bear a course of outward works to mention so wild an interpretation of the apostle's words is sufficiently to confute it. The plain indisputable meaning of that text is this is the sign or proof of the love of God of our keeping the first and great commandment to keep the rest of his commandments for true love if it be once shed abroad in our heart will constrain us so to do since whosoever loves God with all his heart cannot but serve him with all his strength. A second fruit then of the love of God, so far as it can be distinguished from it, is universal obedience to him we love and conformity to his will. Obedience to all the commands of God, internal and external. Obedience of the heart and of the life in every temper and all manner of conversation. And one of the tempers most obviously implied. Herein is the being zealous of good works, the hungering and thirsting to do good and every possible kind to all men, the rejoicing to spend and be spent for them, for every child of man, not looking for any recompense in this world, but only in the resurrection of the just. Thus have I plainly laid down those marks of the new birth, which I find laid down in Scripture. Thus doth God himself answer that weighty question, what is it to be born of God? Such if the appeal be made to the oracles of God, is everyone that is born of the Spirit. This it is. In the judgment of the Spirit of God to be a son or a child of God. It is so to believe in God through Christ as not to commit sin and to enjoy at all times and all places that peace of God which passes all understanding. It is so to hope in God through the son of his love as to have not only the testimony of a good conscience, but also the spirit of God, bearing witness with your spirits that you are the children of God. Whence cannot but spring the rejoicing in him through whom you have received the atonement. It is so to love God who hath thus loved you as you never did love any creature. More than your dog, right? I'm preaching now. More than your dog, more than your pet, more than your children to love God more than any creature so that you are constrained to love all men as yourselves with a love not only ever burning in your hearts but flaming out in all of your actions and conversations and making your whole life one labor of love, one continued obedience to those commands. Be ye merciful as God is merciful. Be ye holy as I the Lord am holy. Be you perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Who then are you that are thus born of God? You know the things which are given to you of God. You well know that you are the children of God and can assure your hearts before him. And every one of you who has observed these words cannot but feel and know of a truth, whether at this hour, answer to God and not to man. You are thus a child of God or no? The question is not what you was made in baptism. Do not evade. But what are you now? Is the spirit of adoption now in your heart? To your own heart, let the appeal be made. I ask not whether you was born of water and of the spirit, but are you now the temple of the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in you? I allow you was circumcised with the circumcision of Christ, as St. Paul emphatically terms baptism. But does the spirit of Christ and of glory now rest upon you, else your circumcision is become uncircumcision. Say not then in your heart, I was once baptized, therefore I am now a child of God. Alas, that consequence will by no means hold. How many are the baptized gluttons and drunkards, the baptized liars and common swearers, the baptized railers and evil speakers, the baptized whoremongers, thieves, extortioners, what think you? Are these now the children of God? Verily I say unto you, whosoever you are, unto whom any of 
one of the preceding characters belongs. You are of your father, the devil, and the works of your father you do. Unto you I call in the name of him whom you crucify afresh, and in his words to your circumcised predecessors, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? How indeed except you be born again, for you are now dead in trespasses and sins. To say then that you cannot be born again, that there is no birth, but in baptism is to seal you all under damnation, to consign you to hell without help, without hope, and perhaps some may think this just and right. In their zeal for the Lord of hosts, they may say, yeah, cut off the sinners, the Amalekites. Let these Gibeonites be utterly destroyed. They deserve no less. No, nor I, nor you. Mine and your desert, as well as theirs, is hell. And it is mere mercy, free, undeserved mercy that we are not now in unquenchable fire. You will say, but we are washed. We are born again of water and of the spirit. So were they. This therefore hinders not at all, but that you may now be even as they. Know ye not that what is highly esteemed of men is an abomination in the sight of God. Come forth, you saints of the world, you that are honored of men, and see who will cast the first stone at them, at these wretches not fit to live upon the earth. These common harlots, adulterers, murderers, only learn ye first what that meaneth. He that hateth his brother is a murderer. He that looketh on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Verily, verily, I say unto you, also must be born again. Except you also be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Lean no more on that staff of that broken reed that you were born again in baptism, who denies that you were then children of God and heirs of the kingdom of heaven, but notwithstanding this, ye are now children of the devil. Therefore, you must be born again. And let not Satan put it in your heart to cavil at a word when the thing is clear. You have heard what are the marks of the children of God, all ye who have them not on your souls, baptized or unbaptized must needs receive them or without doubt you will perish everlastingly and if you have been baptized your only hope is this that those who were made the children of God by baptism but are now the children of the devil may yet again receive power to become the sons of God that they may receive again what they have lost even the spirit of adoption crying in their hearts Abba Father Amen Lord Jesus May everyone who prepares his heart yet again to seek your face receive again that spirit of adoption and cry out, Abba, Father, let him now again have power so to believe in thy name as to become a child of God, as to know and feel he has redemption in your blood, even the forgiveness of sins, and that he cannot commit sin because he is born of God. Let him be now begotten again into a living hope so as to purify himself as thou art pure and because he is a son let the spirit of love and of glory rest upon him cleansing him from all filthiness of flesh and spirit and teaching him to perfect holiness in the fear of God man you know one of the things that I was telling Brendan earlier Brendan was helping me I was like I'm gonna read this tonight and I figured that it was going to be long, and it's hard for people to pay attention for that long. Times were different then. And, you know, there was some things in there that if you understand the message of the cross, you definitely questioned a couple of things. And I get it. You should. But, boy, if they erred, they erred on the side of safety, did they not? They wanted the holiness of God to burn in their hearts. They wanted the fire of God to cleanse their hearts. Amen. And, uh, and, I, and I know that that's, that's the heart of God. God wants us to, to burn and, and for his, his, uh, his holiness to burn in us and for his spirit to, to live in us. I mean, is it, what, did you not hear so many things that you've thought before as a believer? You know, so many, so many things that it was just so good. It's almost like I'm thinking, dude, I, I preached this mess. I've preached these messages for the last 10 years, and it's like this brother preached it all in one night. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah.